Okay, folks, so um, thanks so much for coming to this session, um, which was called, stupidly, Oh Leonard, Where Art Thou? Uh, who knows which Leonard that is? That's fantastic. So most of you came to a session about a bloke called Leonard who you don't know. Fabulous. You're so experimental. I guess that's just Berlin, right? Um, so uh, my name's Jim. I work for Neo Technology. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about graph databases and NoSQL and Neo4j. How many of you guys know Neo4j? Slightly more than low, no Leonard. Okay, so Leonard Euler was the mathematician who 275 years ago invented graph theory, uh, the branch of mathematics upon which graph databases like Neo4j are founded, which is delightful because does anyone know how old the uh, relational theory is? 42 years old. So when you're in your enterprise companies and they say, we need a mature data model, you've got no SQL, five or six years, the relational model, 42 years, which is a great geeky number, 42. And then the mature model, which is the graph theory, 275 years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rant. Uh, I originally was going to speak for 20 minutes and just rant about how NoSQL is going off the rails. Um, but then I discovered I had to speak for 40 minutes. So I've got like ranty bits and then Cody bits, um, just to balance it up a bit. So the, the Cody bits come from these koans. Uh, and uh, if you guys go to uh, this... URI here, this big URI, you'll find a set of uh, pre-compiled koans, that is, broken unit tests that you can fix, and they will gradually introduce you to the Neo4j APIs and how to start thinking graphy. If you want the source, everything in Neo4j is open source, you can pull it from GitHub. So all of the bits of code you'll see today, you can hack on throughout the rest of the day uh, if you find yourself in, God forbid, a boring session. If anyone starts hacking in my session, I'm going to weep. So. Where are we? I live in NoSQL world, not only SQL. And the premise of NoSQL was that we would pick the right database for the kind of data we're storing. So it was a break from the old tradition of, I don't care what my data is, I stick it in Oracle. The NoSQL guys said, well, we have different kinds of data because we're building different kinds of systems nowadays. So we need different kinds of databases to handle that. And so we've seen over the years things like key value stores for simple data at high scale and high availability, represented, I think, around here, uh, fantastically by the guys uh, who produced React. We've got things like column stores, so uh, effectively nested hash map data stores, again, based on similar principles to KV stores, but with more structure in the data, so you get a little bit more richness in there. And of course, you know, the Cassandra and HBase guys may well argue that they have the most scalable column store on the planet. They don't. This is the most scalable column store on the planet. This is the British Museum. It's where we keep all the stuff that we nicked from around the world. And we keep expanding it uh, to, to uh, hold even more stuff that we nicked from around the world. And it has columns, making it the most scalable column store on the planet. We also have uh, the, uh, who recognizes this reference? Uh, keep your hands up if you work for Tengen. Brilliant. Uh, so we also have document DBs, which are great for storing and indexing independent documents. So if you're working in, in a domain where, where documents are prevalent, uh, independent, uh, unconnected documents, then the, the, the family of document DBs are great for that stuff. And this is where I work. Obviously not in Berlin, uh, although I have worked in Berlin. Uh, although I wouldn't call it work, I'd call it more like indentured servitude. That was aimed at these guys at the front. Boo! See, their booing is quite feeble because I have a microphone. Um, and I, I live in this world. I live in a world where data is highly connected. So in a, in a graph database, we tend to store data as nodes, documents, if you will, with key value pairs, and then we relate those documents together with named, directed annotations. This gives us a very uh, simple but expressive data model for describing how data interrelates. And you choose a graph database like Neo4j when you're interested not just in your data, but how that data is interrelated. Step outside of the rant for a moment. In Neo4j, you describe your data in terms of those simple expressive nodes and relationships. In Neo4j, you grab a reference to the database, and then you ask it to create a node. Once you have a node, you can fill that node with stuff. 
It's a simple key value pair metaphor. But Neo4j is a bit militant. It's a bit uh, enterprisey, even, if you like. Everything you do in Neo4j has to be wrapped in a transaction. Everything is always ACID transactional. Any mutating operation on the database is transactional, which is a bit odd, considering a lot of the time, most NoSQL stores allow you to vary those guarantees in order to get scale or performance. Neo4j is not React scalable. You are never going to deploy it on 2,000 machines, switch it on, and be happy. You're going, to, you're going to deploy Neo4j on 20 machines, but the scale it addresses is the increasing complexity of data rather than uh, pure volume. To create relationships, again, this is, uh, this is the Neo4j, we're using the Neo4j Java API here. All we do is from one node, in this case the node Susan. Who knows Doctor Who, by the way? Okay, who knows really, really old Doctor Who? Who knows Susan? Really? One, two? Oh, I love you guys. You've actually seen 1963 episode one, An Unearthly Child. Really? My goodness. Um, aw, hugs. Uh, so who knows Doctor Who only when it became a color TV show? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're more my guys. So in, in Neo4j, and in fact in the koans that you can hack on, there's this rich data set about Doctor Who which you can explore and, and, uh, and find out which doctors fought which baddies with which companions and so on. In Neo4j, creating relationships in the Java API is as simple as the node that you're creating a relationship from, create a relationship to, and give it a name. That's embedding, dumping facts into the database. If you're allergic to Java, um, because it's cool to be allergic to Java nowadays. This same API is wrapped up in JRuby, in Clojure, in Scala. There's a REST API if you're, if you're one of those poor unfortunates off the JVM and so on. So in Neo4j, we give you all of the tools to describe your data in terms of documents and how they interrelate. You could have as many relationships as you want. You can name them as you want. You can put properties on them so you can do weighted graph algorithms and all that good stuff. Which brings me to an ironic point. Why the fuck a relational database is called relational? Right? How many kinds of relationship can you have in a relational database? Uh, somewhere between zero and one, right? Whereas in a proper relational database, you can have as many relations as you want. They can go anywhere you want them to go, and you can name them meaningfully. If you're in a relational world and we happen you're know, in a join to get me and you together, what does that mean? What's the semantics there? Likes? I hope so. Hate? Uh, possibly. Uh, slept with? You would be so lucky. There is no semantic markup in that as there is in a proper database. So in the NoSQL world, we should be happy. We have all of these different data models that we can use, and each of these databases provides us with a bunch of levers that we can pull. We can... Uh, uh, we could be flexible in terms of durability. We can, we can go for something from completely uh, 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 anally retentively durable, which is near for j through to something like ordered rights, or then take your chances. We can do things like sharding. So we can uh, shard data across physical hosts, or we can do replicas, or you know, we can just have one host and take our chances. We can be consistent, or we can trade off uh, uh, consistency for eventual consistency and more scale, or we can take our chances. And so the lovely thing about the NoSQL universe is you should be able to find the right database for the shape of data that you're working with, and you should be able to tune that database for the functional and operational requirements of your business. We should be in data nirvana. Yeah, some sniggers because there are some old guys in the room, but you hipsters, this is how we used to roll when we were young and somewhat cool. Come on, everyone recognizes this symbol, yeah? That was such a muted response. It feels like I'm talking to Danes. Uh, <laughs> but actually, what's going on in, in NoSQL world is that all of the vendors are trying to do the thing that the relational vendors did and trying to say, yeah, yeah, I know that I'm just a Hadoop guy, but Hadoop is a really awesome key value store. I, I, I know I'm a document guy, but hey, documents are awesome for building graphs. And we in the graph world are like, well, the whole world's a graph. You might as well just use us. So we've got this notion of, yeah, we're falling back to, to peculiar and unhelpful old habits where we're saying that there is you know, the one data model to rule them all. And it's damaging. If we take a closer look at this, uh, we can see. I, I, I've been writing about this recently. And um, my, my example here is, is documents to store graphs. But it could equally be uh, uh, you know, graphs as, as poor, poor man's KV stores. It's, it's all about the theme is about choosing the right database. But I'm going to pick on document stores because everyone knows them. Everyone's familiar with them. 
So imagine here that I have a very small social network, and it's stored in a, in a document database. And you can see I have a bunch of users here, and encoded in the documents are some kind of relationships, right? As humans, you can look at that and maybe figure out linkages uh, uh, between these people. And it seems that Gaza down here is uh, one of the more impoverished members of this social network. Um, I would add that three out of these four people are actually from my social network, and their names have been slightly changed to protect their innocence. So if you're in a document DB world, or you've stored these things in a KV store or something like that, you can infer relationships. You can do a bunch of processing uh, on these documents here, and you can reify a graph out of it. And it's brilliant, right? Because a lot of the talks today and yesterday will tell you really good mechanisms, scalable mechanisms, for doing this stuff, for being able to take a bunch of disparate documents, feed them through the Hadoop sausage machine, and then out comes insight, right? And that, that's marvelous. So you can now infer in your application that uh, Sally is pretty popular. She's friends with Sam and Jeff, and that Jeff is friends with Gaza. Uh, Gaza's slightly older than that now. Uh, if you were to do this, in a graph database, though, it would look a bit different. It would be stored natively with those relationships. You don't need to compute them. The structure of your domain is reflected directly in the data store you're using. You don't have to process a gazillion documents to get your graph. Your graph exists. It's the way it's stored. And then you can traverse that graph very naturally using the tools that graph databases provide for you. I have a bad feeling about this. So what happens if I want to extend it? What happens if I want to, you know, God forbid, some of those new business requirements comes in, and I want to extend my application and by implication my data model to cover social selling, social recommendation style selling. So I see what the friends in my social network have, and I want to buy it. And that's so human, isn't it, right? Your mate gets like a new gadget, and you want that gadget. Um, you know, uh, actually, that's not true for all of us. For example, Paul Ingalls, who's sitting in the middle of the crowd, he just watches the Apple RSS feed and chucks his credit card over to Steve Jobs. But generally speaking, some of us are a bit more considerate than that, and we just want the stuff that our mates have. Um, and you can see this kind of social recommendation service cropping up absolutely everywhere. Now, in a graph database, it's pretty easy just to add things like purchases into your, uh, into your database. Graph database is a schema free, pouring in new relationships. Jim bought Mac. Jim loves Mac. Mac loves Jim. And oh, no, sorry, that was the jobs implant again. Um, it's harder in a document database because you don't have the right level of expressivity. What you end up doing is either encoding purchases inside the documents that represent your users, or you have a separate set of documents that represent those purchases, and you compute the relationship. Again, you use one of those lovely scalable sausage machines where you pour all of the documents in and get sensible stuff out. But that's a hard job compared to just running a query. In a graph, you can already find out quickly who purchased what, and by implication, you can find out very easily, just by following the lines, what your friends have purchased. But it goes from bad to worse. I love that. Um, to be fair, I would also include in this, down with the Star Wars Holiday Special, Star Wars Episodes 1, 2, and 3, and anything that Lucas meddled with in Episodes 4, 5, and 6. But that's nothing to do with graph databases and everything to do with my own warped upbringing. In a real graph, it's really easy to find the purchases that your friends made. You can traverse out along your relationships called friend, and that will give you immediately the people that are in your social network. It's then very easy to traverse out along edges, relationships marked purchased or bought, so that you can find friends' purchases, or even in this case, friends of friends' purchases. So you're able to, uh, at low cost, uh, Neo4j, for example, will now enable you to traverse about a million uh, relationships per second per thread on shitty hardware. So you can do this at very low cost across very large data sets without incurring the kind of join pain that you will get in a relational data store. Even really, really fast relational data stores like VaultDB still 
incur joint pain when they're trying to do these kind of graph operations encoded in sets. So it turns out that for uh, graph data, uh, documents are the worst kind of store ever, as the fat guy off The Simpsons says. Um, I, I love this. It's, uh, it's delightful. Segmentation fault core dumped. That's how the internet used to be when I was a lad. You know, it was all text-based and like pornography was quite ASCII-driven. It, uh, it was really imaginative stuff back then. Oh my God, look at the umlauts on that. Um, come on, that was localized, especially for you guys. So other things you can do if you've got your data natively uh, represented as a graph is that you can start to run algorithms on it. You can start to use all of that you know, uh, legacy, useful legacy of computer science to start to gain insight into your data. Who remembers Algorithms 101 from university? Really? Fuck you guys should have parted more. Uh, I really don't, and it's really, it's really desperately sad for me, because I find myself in, in the last six or seven months working at this uh, Swedish company where clearly people didn't party enough, because they all remember like algorithms really deeply. Um, once you've rewired for that, it turns out that asking algorithms, uh, using al graph algorithms is a really neat way of exploring your data space. For example, you might want to find the shortest path between graphs, or you might want to find uh, nodes on a path between graphs. You know, I might want to find, if I am here and I've bought a Mac, tell me all of the other people that are in between me and Mac, so I can find some friends who have Macs. In fact, you know, uh, Josh here walked up to me this morning, got his Mac out, this is so embarrassing for you, and, and there were three of us with Macs, he went, oh, Mac party, Mac, 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 Mac. This is a grown man. This is a grown man and a parent. But anyway, you can express that kind of like borderline insanity uh, with a graph algorithm, which is far less embarrassing than being outed in public for acting in a juvenile way. Also, I should add that Josh had threatened to heckle me uh, while I was giving this presentation. And I think that, uh, 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 you're going to do it now. I, you're going to leave now, OK. Um, so I think that that kind of you know, ahead of time pre-heckling will shut him up. So, so in, a graph, in a graph database, you can bring all of those graph algorithms, things like weighted path algorithms, uh, 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 pattern matching, and so on, to bear on your problem. So for example, in Doctor Who, you might want to find out what the most important characteristic of the relationship between the doctor, the good guy, and the master, one of the most uh, evil bad guys in, in the universe. You might want to find out what that is. And so by using a graph algorithm, you can ask for the shortest path in the database between them. In my data set, it turns out that's a, sh that's a path of hop of length one, and the relationship is called enemy of. So the most important thing between those guys is that they really fucking hate each other. Um, obviously, in the BBC version of that, they don't say fucking, because it's much more polite. So you can start to do really, thi really interesting things, like find all of the episodes where Rose Tyler, one of the Doctor's companions, fought the Daleks. So you can start to say, well, is there a path between Rose and the Daleks. And it turns out that that path will, uh, will cross through several episode nodes, which very quickly enables you to query for all of the episodes where Rose, who is awesome, and the Daleks, who look like pepper grinders, but are also scary and awesome, where they battled. That's a really simple, cheap thing to do in a graph database. In Neo4j, we use one of our prepackaged algorithms, so you don't even need to remember algorithms 101. All you need to remember is that you're looking for a shortest path, and you're only going to allow this algorithm, you're going to constrain it to only go along uh, relationships marked appeared in, in any direction, to a maximum of depth two. Run that algorithm, and uh, w the way I imagine it is, you've constructed a little robot. Uh, how many of you guys are properly old like me? Most of you. I'm looking at the haircuts, right? I mean, this is a giveaway. Do you guys have that, like, when you were at school, that thing called Logo, where you had a turtle that would draw, uh, yeah? Awesome. That's the way I imagine this. Obviously not as shitty as Logo. I mean, it's in Java, right? So it's definitely more advanced. Uh, but I imagine it, this description here, this kind of declarative description, creates a little robot, which then runs off around the graph, finding things that it thinks you're interested in. And you've constrained it by depth, and you've constrained it by the kind of relationships you allow it to traverse. But every time you tell the database that the result iterable you get back, next, 
the, the little robot scurries around to the next hop in the database and finds something else that you're interested in and returns it to you. It's so actually a really, really nice metaphor. Well, one of the most wicked things you can do in a graph is do pattern matching. So you don't just have to do, you know, old school style, traverse out, uh, and, you know, depth first search, breadth first search kind of stuff. You can actually start looking for patterns. And I think it's a really powerful metaphor. So when you're doing pattern matching in a graph, what you can actually do is effectively set up a template of a pattern you're looking for, and then get that little robot to run around the graph looking for matches. And I first used this years ago. Uh, in fact, this is what led me to become a user of Neo4j. I was doing some retail analytics, and we wanted to, we wanted to find out how to influence buying behavior. And so our test for this was, well, firstly, our, our constraint was we had to be faster than an Oracle system, a very expensive Oracle system, which would take half a day plus to process a query which would enable us to look for particular patterns. And the pattern that we, we wanted to look for were young men, uh, so, you know, 18 to 35. Sorry, guys. I, I'm on the wrong side of that now, too. It's not good. Young men who were probably fathers. So we wanted someone to find a node which had an age in the right range and hopefully a gender of M. And we wanted to find those guys who had bought nappies, diapers, and who had bought beer. Because that tells us they are probably young fathers, right? I mean, I don't know what young fathers need. Probably tranquilize a gun, something like that. Uh, you really could have done with that last night, right? Uh, and some of those guys had also bought Xbox or bought PS3, but some of them hadn't, which means there was an opportunity there to influence their buying behavior. So what do we do? We create a pattern, and we say to our graph, match this pattern, which is bought beer, bought nappies, young male, not bought Xbox, not bought PS3. And we sent off our traverser into the graph, and seconds to minutes later, we had covered the data set, and we had the opportunity then to put vouchers into the post to influence these guys' buying behavior. 10% off Xbox for the next two weeks, that kind of thing. That was super expensive to do in terms of computation and in terms of money to do that on an Oracle database. It was super cheap to do it in terms of computation and super free to do it in terms of money on Neo4j, given that Neo4j is GPL and therefore, for the most part, free. If you can use MySQL for free, you can use Neo4j for free. Um, of course, you don't want to, right? Because if you don't pay money to me, I won't be able to stand up here and talk about Doctor Who, which would be a travesty. So why graph matching? Because it's super powerful, because you can actually uh, you can actually abstract away from those low-level traversals, and you can, you can just start to declare patterns you're interested in. I used to work with ThoughtWorks, and ThoughtWorks have done several such uh, 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 um, uh, systems with, with their clients. And it enables you to ask questions like, in which episodes did the doctor battle the Cybermen? So you're looking for a pattern now where the doctor battled the Cybermen in some episode. And you're allowed to use a kind of really neat, uh, albeit Java-esque, declarative syntax, which I don't expect you to read, but it is in the koans. So you can set up a pattern declaratively, effectively set the shape of the pattern you're looking for, and then tell the database, go figure this out for me. And the database is able to traverse for you millions of uh, relationships per second, per thread on a shitty computer like mine, and come back to you with answers very quickly. This is a very different model of graph processing than we used to, for example, when we're doing big Hadoop jobs, because this is quick enough to put inside your HTTP request response uh, work. Right? This isn't some big offline batch effort. This is an online transaction processing system where you can retrieve and manipulate data fast enough that you can treat it as being like MySQL. All of which means, um, I, I hope not. Um, so th there's a weird story about this. All of this means, basically, your choice of using a KV store or a document store or a column family store to encode a graph was premature. And this poor bloke is having his own premature problems. I actually wrote this slide deck at Heathrow Airport in the full view of public. And this poor guy was shoulder surfing me as I was typing you know, pictures of premature, premature. And he was just like, oh, man, you poor thing. I was like, dude, 
This is a really complex answer, but it's because I'm going to Berlin to talk about graph databases, and he was just like, Yeah, yeah. You know, when, you, when you're in a hole, keep digging, is, is the lesson I learned. <laughs> so it turns out that if you make the wrong choice, if you say, oh my goodness, these document things look super easy, I'll use those, and you've made the wrong choice early on, then you've, then you've really dug yourself in a hole. Because as your application evolves, you're going to have to do more and more work, more and more computation on, in your code to try and reify graphs, to try and reify more interesting data structures. Right? Actually, what it turns out you, you start doing is you start building your own graph database, albeit one that isn't invented by a bunch of Swedish guys with nothing better to do. That's a hint that they work really hard at making the graph database not suck. You guys, you live in Berlin, you have better things to do, right? You have some wonderfully, really? I really went that quick, that's marvelous. You have better things to do than build your own graph database on top of non-graph infrastructure. So don't make a premature decision. You know what your application's data topology is going to be like. Don't take a shortcut. Don't use a relational database just because it's what you know. We're already getting beyond that. But I would like you to think about asking the same critical questions about your NoSQL stores. Right? What, kind of, you know, what kind of system am I building? What is the shape of the data? Pick the right store for the shape of that data. Don't just pick the one you know. If you have a system which is naturally key value, please don't pick a graph store on the off chance that you might need relationships. Right? That's, again, the, the flip side of that premature optimization. Um, and, and just, to, I guess, a heartfelt word of advice. Never, ever, ever sit in a busy airport Googling for male premature problems and then clicking on the image links. It, I, I've been there. I've been embarrassed so that you don't have to. All of us, <laughs> so, which brings us to common sense. And I love this, man. I mean, you can do that. Right? I mean, there's, a, there's an existential proof that this is possible. Like, some people whose lives clearly are not valuable to them decided to do this. Um, just because you can build graph infrastructure on top of a relational database, on top of a document database, doesn't mean you should. There are tools out there, like, you know, bigger forklift trucks, that can help you with these kind of problems so that you don't have to do dumb things for yourself. I mean, there are enough people out there doing dumb things for themselves. You don't need to join the league of people who do dumb things, uh, honestly. Mm. All of which, to, to the shock and surprise of the organizers, brings me in with plenty of time, 10 minutes, so that I can take questions from you guys, so that I can encourage you to visit the koans, download them. It's like a bunch of jar files which you can plug into Eclipse or, or IntelliJ and hack on. And I'm happy to take questions from you now. You might want a microphone. I think you might need a mic because they're going to record it. So I can hear you, but maybe the, uh, the video camera can't. So what's the magic behind the storage? What makes the graph tra traversals efficient? So there, there's, there's two uh, features. I can't speak for the other graph databases because I don't know. But in Neo4j, we have a uh, very, uh, over time, finely crafted storage system where we store nodes and relationships separately in separate stores. We make sure that we have a finite offset from an ID for a node or relationship so we can jump into uh, a particular part of the store very quickly on disk. Now, that's OK. That helps us uh, down at the I.O. level to be uh, fast when we're accessing particular parts of the store. But it doesn't mitigate against that ponderously slow spinning of mechanical disks. So what we have on top of that is effectively a, a two layers of caching uh, 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 along with some Java NIO stuff. That means the chances are when you're operating on your data, you're actually operating on it in memory. And then if you're mutating it, it then gets written through to disk. But for read operations, generally speaking, the data that you're working with, because we're a graph, if you hit this node, I pretty much know where you're going to go next. So we can optimize to make sure that most of the time, the data you want to work on is in RAM. And hopefully, if we've, uh, if we've done well, probably in your L2 cache. So it ends up being pretty quick. The point where we get absolutely screwed is if you 
uh, if you uh, treat us as a KV store, and you're just accessing random nodes, which is what a KV store is brilliant at and what we suck at. We're all about ordering access to, a, to, to those nodes because we expect you to follow the relationships. But if you just ask for the complete set of nodes on disk and then randomly pick them, uh, as I have had customers doing and then asking us why they didn't get speed up compared to their relational databases, uh, then we're going to suck. So it's that caching stuff along, coupled with our, our kind of fine-tuned disk layout that gives us performance. Kick it and see. If, you, uh, if, if you've got a mechanical disk, you're not going to be quite as good as, as being on a solid-state disk because the seek penalty can still kick you in the balls. That's a technical term at some point. Um, if you've got a solid-state disk, this stuff really flies. So the question is, how much RAM do I need to traverse a, a modestly sized graph? You say 10 million nodes, something like that. A million nodes, OK, so a, mod a modestly sized graph. So we scale to 32 billion nodes, 64 billion relationships. Uh, the answer to that is I don't know. And it, because the answer is, it depends how much you're storing inside those, relation inside those nodes and relationships. If you're storing like an int per uh, uh, per node, then it's int size plus our uh, byte preamble, which will be about 32 bytes, I think. Uh, so if you've got, uh, you know, the wet finger in the air answer is, if you've got enough RAM to cover half your data set or so, statistically, you're going to get most of your data that you're interested in, in memory at that time, and it's going to be fast. So if you've got, uh, you know, Let's make the numbers easy. If you've got 100 gigabytes uh, data set, you're going to be really fast if you've got 50 gigabytes of RAM and slower as you go down to 10 gigabytes. But the, answer, but the, re the real answer is it depends what you're storing in your nodes and relationships because they're arbitrary documents. So if your nodes contain video files, don't do that with us. Do not do that with us. This is not an endorsement. But if you were optimistic enough to put video files, you know, Blu-ray files inside each node, we are not going to cache many of those when you do a traversal. Sure. Yeah, I think it, uh, if memory serves, we, our, our node data structure costs about 32 bytes. And the relationship structure around the same. But um, so if you're only storing one int, you can see the overhead is massive. If you're storing a, you know, a modest doc, modestly sized document, the overhead is, is by ratio minimal. Uh, I'm going to rely on dudes with, OK, the microphones don't work. So I'm going to go chap with the glasses, then the chap behind, and then the chap at the front. Oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, yes, or you could use a file system. It turns out that file systems are pretty good databases too. Um, so with the obvious bias that you know, I draw my salary from NeoTech and therefore by, by selling Neo4j, yes it is, but test it first, right? Because you might find that the same copy on write B tree that underpins your file system makes that super quick compared to us. So we are really about very connected data. So if you find you know, you've got lots of aliases or linking in your file system, we might be a good choice. If you find that you are mostly hierarchical and you're dealing with you know, big chunky files, a file system might be an okay thing to use. Uh, I'm not going to tell you like we're a silver bullet. I think it, all of us, it behooves all of us to test our domain on the data store before we start going around saying, this is awesome! But if you wanted to go around saying, this is awesome about Neo4j, I'd be happy with that too. Uh, chat behind you, and then the very excitable chat with two arms. Uh, he, he got, I know, he was super excited though, and I can still see you, so I, I'm not going to forget you, I promise. <laughs> 
So the question is, um, I showed some really simple graph algorithms. What else is in our graph algorithm library? And from memory, we have a bunch of path algorithms, as you'd expect, uh, Dijkstra, some support for weighted graphs. I don't think, if memory serves, we have anything for graph layouts. Uh, the closest we get to that is the pattern matching stuff. Does this subgraph match this pattern? The community, however, has a bunch of that kind of stuff. So if you look at the guys who are using us for geospatial, they have a bunch of like smart graph algorithms in the geospatial package that we haven't harvested into our core yet. So for domain, spe no, domain specific, it's ironic considering we're a graph domain, but um, for more specialized algorithms, we provide some. The community provides others because people scratch their own itches. And then, and then because we're a friendly open source community, they tend to publicize those pretty well. And if there's a, an opportunity for us to roll something into our core, you know, author and license uh, per permitting, then we'll do that. So, but check out near4j.org and you'll be able to see a list of exactly what we've got without relying on, relying on my failing wetware. Excitable two-arm guy. And then nudie at the front guy. Okay, so the first question is, what do I think about indexing in Neo4j? Uh, that's a really interesting question because graphs are their own indexes. Typically speaking, a graph has all this linkage. And of course, indexes are just trees, right? So they're kind of easy graphs. Um, typically speaking, in Neo4j, you don't use indexes as heavily as you would in a relational schema because all you want to use an index for is to find a start node. And when you found that starting node, you traverse into the graph to find the information you're looking at. Having said that, um, it, Neo4j depends heavily on, uh, we have a Lucene index and a Redis index uh, uh, for doing indexing. I think they're okay. I noticed that when I, when, when I use them heavily, I find that uh, the XA overhead uh, between Lucene and Neo4j really annoys me, and I really wish at that point that we had our own in-graph index. Um, but idiomatically, indexes aren't heavily used in Neo4j. They are, you, you know, it's typically, you look up your start node, and then everything else is in-graph. So it's okay. Uh, if you find yourself using indexes really, really heavily in Neo4j, you probably want to think about your graph design. The second question is, uh, what's the best API in Neo4j? And this is like hugely opinionated. Uh, so I'm going to tell you the best API in Neo4j is the one uh, supported by the programming language you like. So if you're a Clojure guy, use the Clojure bindings. If you're a JRuby guy, use the JRuby bindings. If you're over in c -sharp world, you have to use the REST API today, unless you've got some genius way of interopping with our Java API. Our Java APIs are pretty ugly. Um, they, are, they are perfectly functional, and they are super efficient under the covers, but they're not exactly super pleasant. The JRuby API looks lovely. Um, but pick the one that makes you most productive. And one more before this guy takes off his t-shirt and, and, and shows, shows me his umlauts. So I'm really pleased that you said you're not employee of Oracle in a way, um, because you've just asked a question that enables me to say really flattering things about Neo4j. But you should, I should also clarify you're not a Neo4j employee. Damn it! Put the check away. Um, typically speaking, uh, unless you're doing massive, massive batch inserts where you're filling up the heap and then GC kicks in and all gets a bit horrible. If you're, if you're like a steady state database running as part of some web app that you've pushed out, uh, your, your insertion speed, your deletion speed is going to be constant uh, in, 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 in terms of time. Uh, bigger data sets don't necessarily imply increased uh, insert time, delete time. What's really nice is bigger data sets also do not imply uh, bigger query time. So we did a, a social network experiment with a with a well-known open source relational database um, with 1,000 people. Each, peop each person had about 50 friends. And we wanted to find people who might know people at depth four. So we, we warmed up the cache in this well-known uh, open source relational database. And uh, that query took about two seconds to run. Uh, we ran the same query in Neo4j. It took two milliseconds. So we decided that instead of using 1,000 people in the network, we'd pour a million people into the network. 
we started running the query on the well-known open source database and got bored. Uh, in Neo4j, that took two milliseconds. So we put 10 million people in. It took approximately two milliseconds. So because we're not doing big set joins, querying the database does not get slower as the data size gets larger. In terms of insert performance, delete performance, the app, unless you're doing a big batch, you're going to be asymptotally uh, scale, uh, a performant depending on the speed of your I.O. channel to disk. Do you remember how long it took to insert those 2 million people? Uh, a long time. Our batch insert performance is not good um, uh, because it, we tend to do silly things like fill up the heap, GC kicks in, so that kind of get, pauses us for a while, and then we do the same again. So given that we hope that you know, a batch insert is typically a, a one-off thing, uh, once you've got the data in Neo4j, you've got it. So you can just you can clone it or copy it around depending on what you need to do. We haven't invested so much effort in that. Do I have time for one more, or am uh, I a short to... short question? Can we do it quickly then, so I don't annoy the uh... about the inserts? Uh, is it possible to create part graphs like you do in Lucene with small indexes and merge the graph uh, to a bigger one when you're doing batch imports? Uh, the answer is yeah, yes. You're, you're effectively just going to be describing. Yeah, when you're inserting into Neo4j, you are describing the data in terms of nodes and relationships. So you can already build up subgraphs, and then later on you can say, hey, I want to import another batch, and effectively import another subgraph. So we don't place any constraints around that. You can batch insert as many times as you like, uh, knowing uh, that there are certain uh, horrible uh, traps if you try to batch insert too much and you get the GC kicking in to clear out bits of heap memory. Okay, then again, thanks to the speaker. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Cheers.